Lord, as we look to your word, we pray that you'll give us an understanding, that you give us an interest, that you would help us to learn from this and maybe to participate in the subject matter less and participate in you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you want to follow along in a paper Bible, an actual book, we have some, if you don't have one with you, you want to, we have some on the back table there that the lovely and talented Anne would love to bring to you <laughs> if you'd like one. So just raise your hand or you can stand up and get back there. There you go. And if you by chance don't have a Bible and you've borrowed one, what we want to, you to know is that you're free to keep that because if you don't have one, it, our job is to put the Word of God in your heart. So the first thing you can do is get it in your hands, right? And you'll see inside that there's a stamp that says Calvary Chapel CUNA with our address. That's not uh, what, what, property of or where we found it. It's just to remind you where it came from. But that's it. It's for you to keep. That's what we want. And if you get one that's written in or something, you can, you can exchange it for a nicer one back there if you want to do that. And we won't look at you sideways. Okay, so if you found 1 Corinthians chapter 10, which, by the way, if you have a loaner Bible, I think it's on page 1,318, 1318, should be. It's the same edition I've got, last I checked. If not, I'm sorry. We got some newer ones. It might not be exactly the same. <clears throat> but also, as your notes say from the bulletin, we have, uh, I want you to turn to two other references that we'll be going to later. One is Psalm 115. Psalm is, Psalm is pretty much the middle book of the Bible. So open up to the center there, you find Psalms, and you go to Psalm 115. And after you've found that, mark it with your bulletin or something, and then find Isaiah chapter 44. So Psalm 115, and then Isaiah 44. So we often look down on African tribesmen and people who worship idols, and we look down on them with disdain. We, we like to think we're above having gods and idols that are made with human hands. But our knowledge can become an idol. People can become idols. We have a TV show called American Idol. Anything that takes first place in our lives is an idol, the false god that we serve. It's kind of strange for us to think of idolatry as something in the modern world, but consider this. There are actually people who worship crawling creatures, in a museum in Egypt, there's a monument to the scarab beetle. If you ever saw the movie The Mummy, those are those little bugs that crawled around. <laughs> it's creepy. The Philistines actually, <laughs> this is, you ready for this, especially this time of year? The Philistines actually worshiped flies. Hindus today say, don't swat a fly, because it might be an ancestor of theirs paying for wrongs in a past life. <laughs> in India, there's a temple with 20,000 rats living in it. The people there believe the rats are reincarnations of their ancestors, including their own children who died during infancy. And as rats, they're taking a short break between human incar incantations. And incarnations, sorry, incantations is like a spell. Okay, incarnations, sorry. There are 330 million gods in the Hindu faith. That's basically eight gods for each person. So there are a lot of gods that go around. In Thailand, there are 20,000 Buddhist temples. In China, a Buddhist statue one time fell on a man, and the family actually sued the Buddha statue in the temple. It was found guilty, and it and 14 other statues were actually beheaded. Wow. Someone has said that the god of the last half of the 20th century and into the 21st is materialism. And I don't know if I'd necessarily argue. Our generation has spent most of our resources and time to accumulate more stuff than any before us. It's the reason many people go to school. Many people choose the kind of work they do. They want to get bigger, better, nicer stuff. If you ever saw the Veggie Tales, Madam Blueberry, they didn't have Walmart. They had Stuff Mart, <laughs> where you went and got your stuff. So I call this message Idle Talk. I think. There it is. He's not throwing up. He's worshiping. <laughs> I just looked at it and thought, that looks like he's barfing. Whoa. Might as well be. Okay, so 
1 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Now, this is a verse that's lacking a little bit in its translation into English. Because in the original language, there's an article before idolatry. So the Greek literally says, the idolatry. Young's literal translation says, wherefore, my beloved, free from the idolatry. And we make fun of, fun of people who put the in front of things that doesn't belong, like the Facebook, the Twitter. <laughs> but here it actually is the idolatry. So what idolatry is Paul talking about? Well, the first word of this verse is therefore, so we have to see what the therefore is. Therefore. Paul's been discussing eating meat from pagan temples. Now he's going to talk about eating meat in pagan temples. It's a difference. Now, pagan temples were run by entrepreneurs. Not only did they sacrifice meat to their gods, but they also had markets to sell it and restaurants to serve it in. Apparently, their gods thought it was all right for them to not only worship them, but also make a buck after their services. See, the idolatry Paul is talking about is actual idolatry, which is the worship of false gods, idolatry. Specifically, the formal sacrificial feasts held in honor of false gods. That's the definition applied to idolatry in this section. You have to note something here. Paul doesn't say we should study idolatry, although it's okay if God leads you that way, but in general, no. He doesn't say we should expand our understanding of idolatry. He especially doesn't say that we should adopt idolatry. In fact, he says the opposite. We should flee from idolatry. Remember verse 13. God will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. The best means of escape from idols is to literally stay away from them. <laughs> Don't go there, right? Don't go there. So verse 15, I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. See, the Greeks highly valued their intelligence. Paul's appealing to that sense of intelligence. He's trying to get them to think for themselves, but with his input. So he says, man, I'm speaking to wise guys. <laughs> Not a wise guy, eh? But wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. Verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So in these next few verses, Paul uses an example that we might find hard to follow. But the Corinthians were well aware of the example, which is why he used it. People use, oh, excuse me, Paul uses examples to help them realize what happens when they eat at a pagan temple restaurant. He begins with what we believe happens when we take communion. The, the wafer and the cup that we have at this church once a month that Jesus did at the Last Supper, just so everyone understands. The cup he's talking about represents the blood of Christ, which is obviously shed for us for the forgiveness of sin. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. The cup of blessing was the last cup presented in the Passover ceremony. So whenever you have a Passover ceremony, the very last one is the cup of blessing. This was the cup that Jesus blessed at the Last Supper. Not the cup, but the contents. And the, the one interpreted as Jesus himself said, the new covenant in my blood. The bread represents the body of Christ which suffered and died for us. These are things that we as Christians have a pretty good understanding of. If you've been around church very long, You've participated in this if you want to, and it just brings you closer to God. In, I, in my belief, I believe it's a cup of juice and it's a wafer, but there's something spiritual that's mixed in too because <laughs> we are communing with Jesus at the same time. So Christians in Corinth would know exactly what Paul was meaning here. And then the next one in verse 17, for we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. So Paul's saying, hey, I know that there are a lot of Christians, and all of them are one in Christ. The Corinthians would have understood this too, because when they ate a meal, it wasn't like our house. We have the table, and you have plates. Well, they had plates, I bet, but they didn't have knives, forks, spoons. Which one's a salad fork? They, they didn't have to worry about that. You know, <laughs> When they ate a meal, they... They reclined around tables that were a lot lower, and they'd lean on one side, 
and then they'd eat with their hand. Break off a piece of bread, and then they'd eat it. And the guy next to him would break off a piece from the same loaf and eat it. And the guy across the table would break off a piece of the same loaf. So because they ate from one loaf that nourished you, that nourished me, that nourished him, that nourished her, they were all united because they ate from the same thing. We have the same type of thing, don't we? If you think about it, order a pizza. <laughs> Doesn't everybody kind of grab a piece from it, at least one? Maybe more. So, <laughs> didn't get this body saying no to too many pizzas. So, <laughs> it's the same type of thing. We're all nourished. So, in their society, they believed, man, if, that's, why they say, that's why Paul says, don't even eat with such a person. Because if you're eating, you're saying that we're one. So, he's saying, remember when we eat? And it's one. The same is actually true with communion. As Christians, we all take the bread and the cup together. We all associate ourselves with the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we're all united as one because of Jesus, whom the bread and cup represent. So now Paul goes further in verse 18. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? This is referring to the animal sacrifice the Jewish priests performed for people. And I have a quote from the Believer's Bible Commentary, and it says, the, the reference here, no doubt, is to the peace offering. The people brought their sacrifices to the temple. A portion of the offering was burnt on the altar with fire. Another portion was reserved for the priests. But the third part was set aside for the offerer and his friends. They ate of the offering on the same day. Paul is emphasizing that, those who, that all who ate of the offering identified themselves with God and with the nation of Israel, and in short, with all of which the altar spoke. So they're one with the priest, one with God, one with each other, because they're all eating from the same, even though it's a sacrifice. So Paul uses logical trains of thought that they could understand. And it's a great method of teaching. When we take communion together, we're one with the Lord. When the Israelites ate meat sacrificed to the Lord, they became one with Jehovah God, because because part of it was consumed in the sacrifice, that's God's version of eating it. It was consumed by God for God. Seems easy to understand once we have all those facts. But he wants to make himself clear. So in verse, eight, verse 19, rather, he says, What am I saying then? That an idol is anything? Or what is offered to idols is anything? So Paul is asking this simple question. Is there anything the idol represents? <laughs> is there anything... Is there any God that these people sacrifice to? Really? And does the meat sacrificed to those idols mystically change in some way? Is it possible that the meat undergoes a change during the sacrificial process? Like before, it's, it's this, and afterwards, oh yeah, now it's, now it's that God's meat. No. In the sacrificial process, can the idol see or hear anything that's going on? Can the idol cause any harm? Can the idol bless anybody at all? The answer would, to all those would be no, because the idol does not represent a god at all. Remember, Paul already wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4, Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and there is no other god but one. Flat out stated. So if the idols have no gods that they represent, who's behind them? <laughs> Let's do a dive and find out. <laughs> Verse 20, rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. Ah, see, now it becomes clear. Now the fog is lifting, blown away. The Gentiles, in their ignorance of things spiritual, which is very true, they were dealing with with demons. They thought they were sacrificing to any number of gods, small g, but there was nothing there. People use idols a lot, even the Israelites, and they should know better. And because of that, the Bible has a lot to say about idols, so I want us to turn now, turn now to Psalm 115. It's a fascinating, to me, there are two references we'll go to, but the Psalm 115, just a great explanation of the truth behind idols. And we'll pick it up in um, verse 4. 
So Psalm 115, verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold. So that's, that sounds impressive. I mean, if you have an idol and it's silver, even if it isn't solid, it's pretty cool. How about gold? I mean, it'd be like at the beginning of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, the little idol. Anybody? Okay, <laughs> just making sure. Is this on? You awake? Okay, the little idol that he held up, yeah, it's, it's made of gold. It's kind of cool. So, but it's just a hunk of gold, as we'll see. Because he said, they're the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. With that kind of an explanation, it's like, what kind of a God have you got? If that's your God, <laughs> those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. Taking this into account, what it says in Psalm 115, does it seem like a good idea to bow down and worship this thing that all you're worshiping is that and there's nothing behind it, but maybe the value of the statue itself? It seems like it's kind of a waste of time. But it's even worse than that. Turn to Isaiah 44, picking it up in verse 9. Those who make an image, all of them are useless, and their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. Who would form a god or mold an image that profits him nothing? I'll wait. <laughs> Anybody? Why would you want to form a god that doesn't do anything for you? I don't know if you guys ever saw the movie Major League. It's a baseball comedy, and the one guy's in, kind of into voodoo, and he has a little statue, Joe Boo, and he prays to him, and he does all this because he can't hit a curveball. It's, it's baseball. But eventually, he comes to a realization. He's in the batter's box, and he steps out. He goes, I'll edit it. He goes, forget you, Joe Boo. I'll do this myself. And he stands in there. Here comes the pitch. Whack! And he hits a big home run. And it's like he's been depending on a god that's just a chunk of wood. And he says, I put more faith in this bat than you. Forget you, Joe Boo. So it's an interesting thing. He came to that realization, but these people have not. Who would form a god or mold an image that profits him nothing? Verse 11, surely all his companions would be ashamed. And the workmen, they are mere men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear, they shall be ashamed together. The blacksmith with the tongs works one in the coals, fashions it with hammers, and works it with the strength of his arms. Even so, he's hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. He's working so hard forming a false god, and it provides him nothing. It doesn't give him anything to eat, doesn't give him anything to drink, because it's just a chunk of metal. Verse 13, the craftsman stretches out his rule. He marks out one with a chalk. He fashions it with a plane. He marks it out with a compass. Isn't that a, the fascinating detail? I can just picture this in my mind, this guy working on this statue. He makes it like the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. So this is his plan. This is what he's going to do. He's going to make a good-looking idol to put in the house. Verse 14, he cuts down cedars for himself and takes the cypress and the oak. He secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine, and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he shall take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half, he eats meat. He roasts the roast and is satisfied, even warms himself, says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. So this guy cuts down a tree, and he cuts it in half, and half of it he puts in the stove, and he heats it up and burns and cooks food, and he's warm, and he's happy, because that wood provided him with something that the wood can provide him with. Verse 17, and the rest he makes into a god, his carved image. He falls down before it and worships it, prays to it and says, deliver me for you are my god. 
even though your twin brother's in the stove, you know? <laughs> it's like, come on. They do not know, nor do they understand, for he has shut their eyes, he being God, because they're so far from him, he has closed their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot understand. And no one considers in his heart, nor is there knowledge nor understanding to say, Hello, I've burned half of it in the fire. Yes, I've also baked bread on its coals. I've roasted meat and eaten it. Shall I make the rest into an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? He's put the fire in there, and I'm holding this God, and it's like, it's nothing. It's nothing. But people spend a lot of time worshiping, really, nothing. It's incredible. Galatians 4, verse 8 says, you can go back to 1 Corinthians 10 if you like. Galatians 4, 8 says, but then indeed, when you did not know God, you serve those by which, or excuse me, serve those which by nature are not gods. Silver, gold, and wood are not by nature gods. They're simply silver and gold or wood molded or shaped or carved to look like a god to them. You see, many people want to make a god in an image, whatever it is. Do you remember what happened 40 days after Moses went up and got the Ten Commandments? You know when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, the people on the ground heard God's voice. And 40 days later, they well, as for this Moses, we don't know where he is. We need a god. Aaron, uh, fashion us a god, will you? So Aaron had him bring the gold, put it in there. He fashioned it with a tool. He said to Moses, well, no, I just put, they, they brought their gold and put it in the fire and it out popped this calf. <laughs> kind of makes you cross your eyes. Like, what? <laughs> He's fashioning it with a tool. And he says, here's the god who delivered you out of Egypt. You see, Moses wanted Aaron to be the one to lead the people, but Aaron was a people pleaser. He did what they said. Moses was a God pleaser. Moses loved the people. Aaron didn't really love them because if he loved them, he'd say, no, God's up there. God's here with us too. He can tell what's going on. Stop it. But he didn't do that way or treat them that way. So what happened? Moses came down, of course, and broke all Ten Commandments before he even got all the way down for the mountain. Just a joke. Anyway, so, <laughs> but they're not gods. Molded to look like a god to them. Paul talks in one, one part of the Bible, he says, that these dumb idols, and he means they can't speak, but I like to use the dumb like we do, too. <laughs> it's just stupid. It really is dumb. And, you know, um, we have a lot of gods today that we worship. But Judges 10, verses 13 and 14 says, Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will deliver you no more. Go and cry out to the gods that you've chosen. Let them deliver you in your time of distress. I guess you could call your carved god Woody, right? Hey, Woody, help us out here. That's why he was called Woody in, in um, Toy Story, because he was carved out of wood. So, Woody... There you go, help us out. And he can't, because he's a piece of wood. And he says, not only does he say in verse 20, rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And he says, and I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. This is why Paul wanted them to flee from idolatry, because it isn't just nothing. It's what the demon is re representing in that idol. That's what it is. It's demons. Idolatry is not just idol worship. It's demon worship. It's getting involved with all things demons. It's you have an idol. You've gone to the store. Demons are us. <laughs> and you're opening yourself up to all kinds of stuff. Paul didn't say that the idol is a demon because it's a chunk of wood or metal. But he says that 
or stone. You know, they carve them out of stone too. But he says that demonic spirits take advantage of idol worship to deceive people and to enslave them. And that's the problem. And here's where Christians, pastors, might lose some people. There he goes again talking about demons. I was fine till now. Well, it's funny because many people believe in angels. They believe in the existence of angels. Angels sound cool. Here's a being we can't see. You probably have big wings, right? Don't we always think of that? And they're protecting us from harm. They're directing us. They're guiding us. Angels are neat. But demons, oh, people think you're crazy to talk about them. It's like, yeah, I think that was a demonic spirit. <laughs> Stay away from that guy. He said the D word, demons. And I think that's in part because they're slightly under the influence of them, whether they recognize it or not. To me, that's one of the reasons demons in the world are one of the reasons why people not only don't believe in God, but are hostile toward him. Because they know it's truth, so they want to make you mad about God and keep you away from him. To me, it's just it validates his existence. If you don't have Jesus Christ in your heart, well, it's sad, but there's plenty of room in there for a demon or two. It's up to you if you want to do that. Now, I'm not saying every non-believer is demon-possessed, but they can oppress you in many ways. But they're real. They really are. Verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Now, Paul isn't saying this is a physical impossibility. Certainly, a Christian could go into an idol temple and participate in a feast. Or it isn't like there's an invisible force shield and you go, and you bump into it before you get in, or bars that drop down, or an alarm, eh, eh, Christian, eh, eh, don't let him in. No, they'll take your money just like they'll take anybody else's. What Paul is saying is that this, there should be no place in a Christian's life for fellowshipping with demons. And he isn't only referring to the communion table. Because when he says the cup of the Lord, this is the kind of a generic expression Paul uses to describe the benefits which come to us through a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have a relationship with him, you're, it's the cup of the Lord. It's this all-encompassing bowl of blessings and benefits. There are no benefits in a relationship with demons. Actually, I, I, don't, I shouldn't say that. I think at first there can be to get you really sucked in. But then once you're in, whew, it's harder to get loose. A table is a piece of furniture where food is set out and fellowship is enjoyed. Here, the Lord's table means the totality of all the blessings. First, you had the benefits. Now you have blessings, which we enjoy in our relationship with Jesus. But there are no benefits, ultimately, to enjoy in a relationship with demons. So Paul says, flee from idolatry. Stay away from it. And here's a big reason not to do this. The last verse we'll look at today. Verse 22. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Wait a minute. First, isn't jealousy a sin? Wait a minute. God can't do that, can he? Well, yes and no. Jealousy is a sin. A husband will be jealous if he sees his wife always hanging around with another man. It's kind of funny, but when my wife and I um, were dating... She had a friend, and he actually got me a job <laughs> way back in the 1970s at a place called Microdata off of MacArthur Boulevard in Costa Mesa, Santa Ana area. And I was a computer operator. And back then, they had the computer rooms with the raised floor and the air conditioning because you had to keep the computers cool and had big reels of tape that I'd have to put on and do a file save. So if everything crashed, they could at least start with the previous days, the end of the day's work, and they wouldn't lose months or years of work. And I would do that every day. And then I'd take and put a right ring in the back, which was a circle, kind of like breaking off the tab on a cassette tape if you didn't want it recorded over, because you'd just put tape on it. But if you don't, you do it by accident. So I would do the file save, and it would be going like this, and then I'd start doing printer reports. And the bigger the report, the slower, until the tape would go... And I can always tell when a file finished because the tape reel will be going faster. So we'd have this whole spinning thing. But anyway, the point is, the guy who got me the job, 
my wife introduced me to him. We became friends. His name was Paul. And he had flashy stuff. He was a single guy. He had a Corvette, really nice uh, silver Corvette. He was a programmer. He was kind of a big wig there. And they actually wanted to turn me into a programmer. But then they hired someone else to be my boss, and I had to train her. And I was like, I'm out of here. It's just too much pride in the way. But anyway, so Paul used to go out to lunch with Chris. And one week he'd pay, the next week she'd pay. One week he'd pay, the next week she'd pay. And I was a little not right with that. I never told her that. Maybe even right now she doesn't. She's learning that for the first time. But after we were married, I was still working there. And so we're, there's a big staircase. And I go down the staircase. There's a landing. And then we turn and go. And we got down to the landing. And Paul says, so can I still take Chris out to lunch? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, why? I said, because that's my wife now. And he's like, wow. See, I would have been provoked to jealousy, but when I got home and told her, she was like, ooh, she liked that. <laughs> it wasn't that she's missing out on lunch. That's kind of a bummer, I suppose. But the big thing was, ooh, he's stuck up for me. He wants to be with me. He doesn't want anyone else with me. I like, oh, he does love me. No, 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 no. <laughs> it was pretty cool. And so I was worried about how she'd take it. So jealousy. A um, husband can see his wife always hanging out with another man, and it can be a wife seeing her husband hanging out with the same woman all the time. That may not be good. Um, in fact, it can be bad. It can be innocuous. But you can still be jealous. Jealousy doesn't care if it's true or not, right? <laughs> it's just that you're jealous. But if we're jealous of what others have, and we don't have it, that's jealousy. And it's listed in scriptures under another word. It starts with C, coveting. And that is a sin. Now, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, Here's God, in giving Moses the Ten Commandments, he tells him to tell the people not to make idols. And why is that? In verse 20, verse 5, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. That's a huge reason not to get into idolatry. You don't want to make God jealous of your attention because you're focusing it on something evil. You see, people don't think demons are, it's no big deal, this little guy might poke me in the side with a pitchfork a little bit. He'll lead you to anything. Demons have a philosophy that's simple as ABC. Anything but Christ. That's where they point you. <laughs> it doesn't matter what else you do. In fact, you talk to other people, a lot of people. I'm into Buddhism. Oh, that's cool. You know, I got this Hindu thing going on. Awesome. I'm into Jesus. Ew, what? They just get creeped out by him. And what did he do that's so creepy? Really? He just loves people. And what did, yes, he had radical encounters with them, but only if they misrepresented him. You ever notice that? Most of the time when he get mad, it's because they didn't represent him properly. It's like, yeah, stop it. <laughs> but anyway, so he's jealous. God gives us his undivided attention. But we give him our undevoted attention. And that makes him jealous. So we don't want to provoke him. William Kel Kelly said this, quote, love cannot but be jealous of wandering affections. It would not be love if it did not resent unfaithfulness. Unquote. Provoking the Lord to jealousy is a bad idea. David Guzik has a quote here. The Lord has a right over all our worship and has a right to be offended if we give our fellowship to demons. It doesn't matter what the Corinthian Christians didn't it doesn't matter that the Corinthian Christians didn't intend to worship demons at these heathen feasts in pagan temples. If a man puts his hand into the fire, it doesn't matter if he intends to burn himself or not. He is burned just the same. It's not what I wanted to have happen. And then he closes with this. Are we stronger than he the Christians in Corinth believed in their hearts that they were strong believers, but they were not stronger than God. Anybody here stronger than God? I'll wait. Any takers? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> I don't think so. So I call this message Idle Talk. And we know what idle conversation is with a different spelling, right? Like an engine idling. It's just talk you have in the line at the supermarket with a guy you don't know. Or sitting on a plane or a train or not too many trains here. But you get what I'm saying, just idle chat. You can have idle chit chat with people you know and love really well. Go in the barbershop. Oh, the weather's so cold. Oh, it's so hot. Man, it hasn't been this hot here in years. That's idle talk. But this idle talk, 
This is the stuff we need to pay attention to. It all, it's all summed up, and I'll turn back to it, in the first verse. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Don't hang around. Don't try to make it better. Now, it doesn't mean if you see someone struggling that you don't help, but you're not going there to fellowship with them. You're going there to help them to see the truth and come to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this talk. Thank you for this section of scripture. Thank you for the fact that we recognize from your word, idols are nothing because we're making a God out of something that the real God made. We're taking something that you created and shaping it and forming it into something you never intended it to be because you don't even want us to make images of you because you want us to just worship you with the knowledge we're given by your word. So we thank you that you've given us that. We pray that we would grow, grow closer to you every day because of your great love for us. And you showed it when Jesus went to the cross. I pray that we'd all appreciate that. In Jesus' name, amen.